Hello, and welcome to Peopling the Past. My name is Melissa Funky, and I am Assistant Professor of Classics at the University of Winnipeg. What topic are you talking about today? Today, I am talking about the genre of dramatic performance from the ancient Greek and Roman worlds known as mime and the actors who performed it. My work focuses broadly on dramatic performance in the ancient Greek world, and lately I've been working a lot on mime. But first things first, I need to clarify, ancient mime is not like modern mime. The actors were allowed to speak. So let's start by explaining a bit about the ancient genre itself. Mime was a very flexible and sometimes informal type of theater that had its roots in farce. And what's really interesting is that unlike comedy and tragedy, which are deeply associated with the city of Athens, the farces that eventually developed into mime originated on the Peloponnese, in places like Megara, Corinth, Sicyon, and Sparta. By the 4th century BCE, mime was an identifiable genre, which focused on specific character types and featured scenes from everyday life. From its beginning, it was a very flexible type of theater. It could be very formalized, very educated, or it could be more informal and crude. And this is what I'm interested in, in that second type, because it tells us a lot about entertainment that could be accessed by the widest possible variety of people in the ancient world. This was truly theater for the masses. This cruder form of mime was very interested in bodily function, so things like eating and drinking and having sex. Its plots revolved around typical dramatic conflicts, things like mistaken identity or adultery, and they often used repetition and slapstick to comic effect. Mime was also very widespread in the ancient Mediterranean, especially from the Hellenistic period onward. We know that it was popular in the Greek East, so places like Antioch in Syria were known for producing famous mime performers. We also know that mime had become quite popular in Rome by the second century BCE. And there it started to take on aspects of Roman comedy and native Italian farce. Basically, mime was an ultra flexible genre, and it could take on aspects of any cultural and performance traditions it came into contact with. It thrived for nearly a millennium. Since we're thinking about the real lives of real people in the ancient world, let's talk about mime actors. We know that mime actors performed in a wide variety of contexts, from the courts of Philip II of Macedon and his son Alexander, to public theaters throughout the Roman Empire, to the private banquets of the wealthy, to the agoras of cities like Oxyrhynchus in Roman Egypt. Unlike actors in other dramatic forms, mime actors performed without masks, and in the case of more informal street-based performances outside of formal theatrical spaces. An author writing in the late 5th century CE named Caricius tells us that mime actors were actually known for their very good memories because they had to remember what they had uh, learned during preparations for performances. Mime actors often were part of traveling troops and there were even official guilds of mime actors. The troops could be composed of free or enslaved people and they typically had a leader known as the Archimimus or Archimima. Now, if you were paying close attention to that term, you noticed that it appears in both a masculine and a feminine form, which means that women were also mime performers. And this is unlike other dramatic genres from the ancient Greek and Roman world in which men played all the characters. So for example, we have an inscription from Aquileia from the third century CE that commemorates a mime actress named Basilla. We also know of a freedwoman, Fabia Arate, who was an Archimima, and she earned enough through performances and through running her troop of mimes that she was able to leave behind a major funeral monument for herself and for her husband. And on this monument, it lists 14 slaves that she was wealthy enough to free. And in fact, some very well-known women were associated with mime, such as the Empress Theodora, who married the Emperor Justinian. What sources or data do you look at? Studying ancient performance means that I need to look at literary evidence. So things like scripts of plays and texts that describe the circumstances of performance and the cultural position of mime and mime performers. So for example, the orator Demosthenes from fourth century Athens complains that Philip II of Macedon welcomed low comedic actors, that means mime performers, at his court. 
authors like Athenaeus and Diodorus Siculus, who wrote several hundred years later in the context of the Roman Empire, also loved to tell salacious stories of mime performers and performances, like the famous anecdote of Antiochus V, a second century Hellenistic king who acted naked alongside mime actors at a banquet. So stories like this can tell us a lot about the position of mime actors in society and the reputation of mime itself. There's also a wide variety of material evidence for mime scattered across the Mediterranean. Visual evidence of performance is particularly helpful to me, like the statuettes of mime performers we've already seen, and this relief from what's now Libya that depicts mime actors taking part in a slapstick scene while a female actor looks on. She's on the right. Images like this can help us better understand costuming and sets. The type of evidence for mime that is perhaps the most informative is papyrus fragments that preserve actual mime scripts. We don't have very many of these, and the main examples that we have all differ slightly from one another, but this is actually helpful because they tell us more about the various kinds of preparation for performance. One papyrus actually has two different kinds of mime scripts, uh, one on each side, and it's likely that this came from a technical manual on mime. On one side is a full script. It's quite detailed and sophisticated. It takes place in India and it contains all kinds of allusions to Greek tragedy. What's most exciting when we think about a performance is that this papyrus contains cues for sound effects. So we have things like cymbals and drumming and lots of farts. The other side contains what seems to be the script for an individual actress. It contains mostly her lines only. Um, she's playing an adulterous woman pursuing her lover. So it's very clear from this script that this is what an individual actor would use to prepare. Now we shouldn't be surprised to find mime scripts in a city like Oxyrhynchus. Since it was a city with a sizable population, around 30,000 uh, at the time that we're looking at, with Greek, Roman, Jewish, and indigenous Egyptian inhabitants. It also clearly had an appetite for theater. There are estimates that the theater in Oxyrhynchus held about 11,000 spectators. So mime, as this cross-cultural art form, uh, was well suited for a multicultural city like Oxyrhynchus with an appetite for theater. A 6th century CE papyrus from Oxyrhynchus that I've been working on lately, along with my collaborator C.W. Marshall, is a unique mime script because it contains stage directions, which are few and far between in the evidence for ancient Greek and Roman drama. This papyrus contains the best and most full example of uh, stage directions that we have in all of our evidence for ancient Greek and Roman drama. Now in this papyrus, the stage directions indicate something that's happening while various actors are speaking. So we have a good sense of the actor's entries and exits and where they're meant to be positioned on the stage at various times. We also see evidence of slapstick humor with some of the characters hitting each other and falling over other characters. It's clear from the crude jokes in the script that this is street theater. So we can also tell that there would be no major set one that we might expect to find in a more formal theatrical space. The plot involves an elderly female slave who devises, rehearses, and attempts to pull off a ruse with a wealthy soldier. And the use of masculine forms to refer to the actor playing the part of the female slave suggests that this performance involved cross-dressing for comic effect. While all of the actor's lines are labeled using underlined letters of the alphabet, so alpha, beta, gamma, so on and so forth, there is one extra character who is labeled the akairos. This means the untimely one, but we would better translate it as the jerk. So this is a character similar to the awkward neighbor in sitcoms from the 80s and 90s. That's right, we have an ancient Steve Urkel here. We also see some terms in this script that reflect the cultural makeup of Oxyrhynchus, such as Nana Mu for the old woman and Abba for her elderly male conspirator, which suggests that these characters are actually meant to be understood as Christian or Jewish. And on that note, there's also a very crude joke about a circumcised penis. So what can this material tell us about real people in the past? Evidence like the papyrus script I've just been talking about tells us a lot. 
First of all, it tells us about mime actors and what they were doing on stage, perhaps what they were wearing on stage, and how they may have prepared for this performance. But it also tells us about the ways that people in places like Rome and Egypt entertained themselves. It tells us about the ancient form of popular culture. I mentioned earlier that this crude slapstick form of mime reached the widest possible audience. A performance like the one captured in this papyrus, per performed in the agora of 6th century Oxyrhynchus, would have been watched by enslaved people and free people, the poor and wealthy alike, and people representing all the cultural groups in that city, allowing them all to share in theatrical culture. So a mime like this offers us a taste of the cultural appetites of real people in the ancient world. Thank you for watching.